Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and today we're going to be discussing the concept of relative density. As many of you will already know, relative density is the preferred mechanism proposed by many flat earthers to explain the downward motion of material near the Earth's surface. This ridiculous notion is a product of both their misunderstanding of how buoyancy forces actually operate and the work undertaken by Albert Einstein. In no sense did Einstein ever assert that gravitation does not result in the acceleration of objects. In fact, one of the important verifications of Einstein's theory was that in the non-relativistic limit it tended towards the Newtonian formulation. But rather than rely on a theoretical argument, what we're going to do today is apply ourselves to designing an experimental apparatus that will accurately measure the rate at which heavy objects fall near Earth's surface. We will then develop observational campaigns to determine what parameters change the rate at which this fall occurs. The design of both the instrument and the observational setting in which it is used will be independent of any assumptions about the character of the physical process that is in operation. In particular, if the rate at which objects fall is entirely a function of relative density, then the results provided by our instrument throughout the observational campaign should be able to confirm this. Consider a simple sealed vessel. Inside the vessel we have a test mass of known geometry and density, and a medium of known density. We can then repeatedly drop the test mass and observe the rate of fall of the test mass within the chamber. One of the important steps in instrument design, or experiment design, is the consideration of physical effects that might impact the results we achieve. This step is consistently ignored by flat earthers, who have no idea how to go through it, and have no idea how to remedy the problems that might exist with their experimental setup. So let's show them how it's done, shall we? The first problem that leaps to our attention is the fact that, for a gaseous medium, the density is not going to be constant throughout the chamber. There will be density stratification. The second problem that arises is interaction between the test mass and the medium in the chamber. There will be frictional effects, there may be currents that operate in the medium that will impact the motion of the test mass. Contact between the test mass and the medium will also result in ionization that may have electrostatic impacts on the motion of the test mass. All of these effects need to be reduced so that we can achieve the most accurate results possible. The most direct and immediate solution to all three of these problems is to evacuate the chamber as completely as we can, thus reducing the density of the medium inside the chamber to as close to zero as we can manage. For this purpose, we attach a vacuum pump to the outside of the test chamber. It should always be remembered, however, that no vacuum is perfect. But this is not the only countermeasure we can employ. We can also place the test mass inside a carriage. The carriage will be pulled down mechanically ahead of the test mass and will push any residual medium out of the way. The descent of the carriage will be adjusted by a control mechanism in response to the position of the test mass, which will be detected optically. This carriage will thus protect the test mass from any drag effects, but will also provide a mechanism by which the test mass can be transported to its drop point. As the carriage moves, it will exert a mechanical force on the drop chamber. This will be compensated for by a series of counterweights. We must also consider the possibility that the motion of the test mass may be impacted by external electromagnetic forces. The potential impact of such forces may however be minimized by making appropriate decisions about the materials and the design of the drop chamber casing, the drag-free carriage, and the test mass itself. While the influence of electromagnetic forces cannot be completely excluded with appropriate choices at this point in the design process, we can reduce their effect to be insignificant. It will doubtless come as no surprise that these basic physical principles have already been applied to the design of a real-world instrument. In this case, the Lacoste FG5 absolute gravimeter. This slide shows the mechanisms that are found in the interior of the FG5's drop chamber. These mechanisms include the drag-free cart, the rails for the drag-free cart, the counterweights, the motor and adapter for the drag-free cart, and the vacuum pump. Here we have a close-up of the drag-free cart and the test mass. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the construction and design of this particular module. 
but both of its components have undergone multiple refinements to improve their performance over the years. The key element of this component of the machine is the corner cube reflector, which is the brown pyramidal structure in the center of the figure. The laser interferometer that tracks the position of the test mass as it falls is housed in the base of the unit, alongside the super spring. The super spring is a sophisticated active suspension unit that detects and compensates for any external motions impacting the unit as the test mass drops. The drop chamber itself contains temperature and pressure sensors that record and monitor conditions within the chamber, as well as a variety of mechanisms for confirming the mechanical alignment of the system and the operation of the laser interferometer. Here we see an FG5 gravimeter that has been set up and is ready to operate. On the top of the unit we can see the shiny metal cylinder that encases the drop chamber, beneath that the base that houses the laser interferometer and the super spring. To the left of the unit is the control mechanism. This is used to control conditions within the gravimeter, operate the gravimeter, and calibrate the various subsystems. It also records the observations made using the gravimeter. So there we have it, an instrument for observing the rate at which the test mass falls. It doesn't care why the test mass falls, it doesn't care what the guiding physical principle is, all it does is observe the trajectory of the test mass as it falls. At their heart, all gravimeters rely on the same basic principle, which is to observe, by different mechanisms, the force or acceleration that is applied to a test mass. A variety of techniques are used to measure the force or acceleration, but common to them all is an absence of any assumptions. All they do is observe the acceleration or force. They do not make any assumptions about the origin of the acceleration or the force. So let's now use the instrument we've designed and the instruments other clever people have designed and use them to observe the rates at which the test masses fall in various conditions. When designing an experiment, it is usually best to try and minimize the variation in environmental conditions. To this end, it is always best to standardize the temperature and pressure at which you deploy the instrument. This can be done by placing the instrument in a temperature and pressure controlled room. If the rate at which an object falls is a function of relative density, then we would expect this rate to be consistent between measurements made in standardized pressure and temperature conditions. This is not observed to be the case. The same principle is illustrated by borehole gravimeters. These are sealed, self-contained units that are dropped down the inside of a hollow pipe. Yes, the density of the medium inside such a gravimeter will vary as a function of pressure but it will not be in any way responsive to the distribution of mass around the gravimeter. Nonetheless, these gravimeters are used by mineral exploration companies to detect subsurface ore deposits. If relative density were the reason for objects to fall for the downward force experienced by objects near Earth's surface, then these instruments would be useless. Yet they aren't useless. They do help determine the depth at which ore deposits lie. Here we see two time series for superconducting gravimeters which have been making observations at the same location in environmentally controlled conditions over a long period. The panel on the right shows clear seasonal variations in the gravity measurements obtained by the instrument in response to mass deposition into and mass withdrawal from the water table overlying the instrument. Like most superconducting gravimeters, this instrument is located underground. Therefore, in wet conditions, when the water table is full, there is more mass overhead. This provides an upward attraction that weakens the force of gravity. In dry conditions, there is no such force acting upwards, and the force of gravity downwards is stronger. For those in the audience clinging desperately to the tatters of the relative density argument, I would remind you that A. Superconducting gravimeters do not have any air in them. They operate at 11 degrees Kelvin and any air inside will freeze out automatically. And B. Humid air is less dense than dry air. So, gravimetry is used commercially to locate subsurface ore deposits and subsurface water resources. It is also used for ocean floor exploration. Keen-eyed users of Google Earth will have noticed that on occasion there seem to be these straight trails leading across the map where the detail seems to be much better defined than in general. 
These are actually sonar paths. They are very high resolution recordings of ocean floor topography. The broader, larger scale details are actually the result of gravimetric analysis. Because the rock that comprises the ocean floor is denser than ocean water, areas with high topographic relief, such as underwater mountains or plateaus, have a higher gravity signal. Areas of lower topographic relief, such as abysses or depressions, have a lower gravity signal. Analysis of gravitational acceleration as measured at the surface or above can be used to reconstruct, in broad detail, the topography of the ocean floor. The accuracy of these reconstructions can then be confirmed using sonar soundings. While sonar is higher resolution and more accurate than gravimetry, it is also vastly more expensive and slower than gravimetric reconstructions. Further, the accuracy and resolution of gravimetric techniques is improving as we refine our instrumentation and our deployment methodologies. The gravitational signals of underwater mountains and canyons is also used by submarines. Submarines carry what are called gravimetric gradiometers that measure the spatial gradient of the gravity field as they move along. They use these gradients to passively detect and navigate around any underwater obstructions. They need to do this precisely because the large-scale mapping of the ocean floor is not adequate at high resolution, and mapping by sonar would betray their position to the vessels around them. So hopefully as a result of this presentation, you can now see that there are a number of practical and commercial applications of gravimetric observational techniques, from mapping the ocean floor to passively navigating submarines, to detecting underground mineral deposits, all the way through to detecting subsurface groundwater. All of these applications rely on the Newtonian theory being accurate on a planetary non-relativistic scale. And indeed, Newtonian theory is accurate in this realm. Any claim that Newtonian theory is inaccurate, obsolete, out of date, can no longer be applied, is simply and categorically false. Any such claim may be completely disregarded. It is either the demented rambling of a madman or the alluring fantasy of a conniving and amoral charlatan. So I think that's where I might leave this topic. All going well, this will be my last foray into anything related to Flat Earth. I don't see the value in it anymore. Instead, I will be turning my attention to disassembling young Earth creationism, starting with a discussion of geochronology. I hope you'll join me then.